Hello friends, welcome to MacDrop Bookstop. This is part two of our Iran episode with The Blind Owl by Sadeh Hedayat. This is considered one of the greatest novels of Iran and possibly the region. The author was extraordinarily troubled. It was written in the 1930s. I don't know how much the time and place matters. There are certainly, certainly cultural references to Persia, certainly cultural references to India and its influences on Persia. But let's put that aside. This book is terrifying. This book is... Uh, a trip. It sucks you in. It is engrossing. It's psychological horror. The name of the novel, or novella, let's call it, it's quite short. This version is 75 pages from when the story actually starts. So we'll call it a novella. It's, uh, I don't know what part of this novella is the real thing. The first third of it feels like a kind of a dream, but the same symbols recur. There's a woman in a black dress. There's an old man hunched over who has this rasping, horrible laugh. There's a moment where our narrator, who is apparently living in some deserted outskirts of town, surrounded by ruins, is peering through a window that wasn't there before in a wine cabinet where there's a bottle of wine which is another symbol that will recur and he looks out through this window and and sees the woman and the old man the same woman and old man he draws on pencil case after pencil case that's his job he draws on he he is a pencil case artist and he sees them out there and Without movement, you hear this laughter, this cackle, and the woman just stares, and this is, this is, this, this is the scene. I don't want to give away very much of this book to somebody who would like to read it. Um, it was extraordinarily dark, extraordinarily dark, and... I have mixed feelings about it, to be sure. I wanted to read it a second time before doing this video because I wanted to analyze it, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Now, apparently there's legends out there, and in fact, even in Iran, people will tell you, and it's been banned in Iran for pretty much since it was published the first time and since it was written. And they'll tell you it causes people and encourages suicide. I don't think that is the case. It is extraordinarily dark. Um, and I could not bring myself to read it a second time in such a short succession. I feel that it did cause me some kind of depression. I don't. I don't think it... <laughs> I don't think it has any magical powers, but it is a it is a psychological portrait of of a lost soul. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like, and it asks me as the reader, can I love a book that does not love itself? Can you love a person that does not love themselves? Well, yes, you 
can. But what's it going to do to you? I asked this question in the book for China as well. Um, what is the purpose of reading an immoral novel? I don't think this novel is immoral. I just think it's deeply disturbed and uh, there's nothing like it. Um, I almost wanted to compare it to Pedro Paramo, which I still I still think I like more than this novel. If I had to pick one, do which one do I think is more well done, more interesting, more rereadable. In, in pretty much every respect, I think I like Pedro Paramo more, but I also don't quite feel right comparing this to Pedro Paramo. It's a true, it's really in its own, it's in its own field. For one, it's narrated in um, first person, just like Pedro Paramo, but you are locked, whereas in Pedro Paramo, the narrator kind of blends into the town, into the scenery, and you become much, the, the story becomes much bigger than the narrator. This story closes. The narrator, the narrator is a four-walled prison in which you are encased in this story, and you are trapped in the few symbols that make up this person's psyche, interacting with each other in different ways, playing themselves out in different stories. Now, there are moments when I feel like, okay, maybe this is the real story, because these symbols, it's almost like the, the book is telling story after story with the same symbols, but combining them in different ways and mixing them. And so you never know which one is the real story. In fact, it might be impossible. It would be like untangling this interlocking puzzle. Um, and perhaps there is an answer, and per perhaps other people have analyzed this book, I'm not sure I care to dig deeper. Um, I may, but but why? I, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there must be something. There must be something here that um, goes beyond, because people have really devoted research papers. You just, just a search on YouTube will show you academics have studied this book, and and its influences, and maybe there's more here than just a, a psychological trauma. It's worth noting that the author himself did commit suicide, and that that is a major theme in this book, and that is what it is accused of causing. Um, so this it's fair to say that this book comes with a hefty... Uh, warning that and pretty much anyone you listen to discuss this book will say stay away from it if you are not feeling in a strong state of mind it was really interesting to read this book uh, in between the two volumes of persepolis which i discuss in the last video which i actually i made about Five minutes before making this video. Um, Persepolis seems so far removed from this. You know, it's from the same country, and yet neither, I don't, I don't think either, really told me much about Iran. I mean, maybe it did. I, I guess Persepolis taught me more of the history, but the Blind Owl has some of these cultural symbols just a few, just a sprinkling. It's one of those that there's nothing inherently. I think I think perhaps this story could have, this situation could have been in any setting. With maybe a few changes to the symbols, but. 
there's a lot more that I could and may say about the symbols and about the book in the future. But when I finished it, I don't know, I didn't feel... I guess I, I guess I just felt liberated. I felt, I felt happy to be out of it. Um, but it, it left me with this certain kind of oppressive feeling that I had just spent a few hours in, in a room with no, uh, light, with no sound with no sensation other than this kind of lucid hallucination that this book is. Uh, but it had, there was something about this book that was incredibly hypnotizing. That was, that it hypnotized me. Um, about in the first, the first few chapters, I could picture what the narrator was describing in such vivid detail in my own mind. And some of the creepiest moments, like, are not, they're not moments of jump at you kind of horror or like something horrible in particular happens, but it's unnerving. This book is just extremely unnerving from start to finish. Uncomfortable. It really, it sends shivers down my spine just thinking of that moment where he looks through that window that he can't find later, that was never there before, and sees the woman and the man there for the first time, and then knowing now, reading the whole book and knowing what these symbols mean, uh, gives it a, a whole different sensation as well. This is another, I guess, Halloween kind of book. Um... The resolution is far from uh, the, re the 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 way the book ends does not give you closure or final answers. You he you hold here in your hand a novella. You're holding a tormented mind in your hand, and if you allow yourself to be hypnotized and drawn in. You need to, it's, it's a stress test for your mind. You come out of it, and um, especially if you relate to some of the feelings or the images or you, um, or you can really connect with some of the archetypes. It's a bit of a stress test. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not saying this in the sense that I feel like, oh, wow, this really depressed me or anything like that. Um, but it definitely, definitely shakes you a little bit. It shakes you. It, uh, it, it, it gets at some of the, the deeper, um, it, it intermingles the id, the subconscious with, with base desires, with, uh, with murderous desires. And it's just, um, these are, these are feelings that, uh, perhaps exists somewhere within every human, but um, to, be, to be so written, to be so fixed in words, to allow somebody else to um, experience it is, is a wild thing. And I, again, I don't, I don't think there's any book like this ever written. Um, let me know if I'm wrong. I don't want to say anything else because I don't, um, for one, I don't understand the book enough to do it. I understand it, again, on that subconscious level that I felt that I understood Pedro Paramo for the first time. But unlike Pedro Paramo, I do not wish to read or listen to this three times in a row to um, grasp it at this time. I don't uh, feel ready for that or... Um, like it's something I want to do at this time. And I think that's perfectly understandable, but I am glad I read it. I am glad I have it. Um, and I think, I think even in this video, I may be taking a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, self-indulgent pleasure in the 
kind of mystery uh, of this book and the mystique, the uh, urban legend nature of of its uh, of its horror, of its psychological horror, and and playing that up. That's not intentional, though. I do think that it's coming from a place of sincerity that this is kind of a wild, um, possibly dangerous artifact. But such is literature. And that will do it for Iran. Persepolis and the Blind Owl. Thank you all for watching. And uh, I hope you will continue to join me through this series. This is, I'm sure, a bit of a, an unconventional pair of episodes, but such is this channel. I um, read them, and whatever mood I'm in, whatever clothes I happen to be wearing, wherever I am, I make the video, let you know what I think of it. And unedited, unfiltered, you get my thoughts. So take care, everyone, and we'll see you in the next episode.